Hey, what's up everybody? It is Kellen here from Star Your Systems again, and welcome back to MXGP3, where today we're going to be recapping the 2019 MXGP of Trentino in Italy. I uh, wanted to get back into playing MXGP3 today because, well, quite honestly, I had more fun playing this game uh, than I did MXGP Pro when I uh, did the British review and then followed it up the week after with the Balkan Sword review. Uh, I just felt MXGP3 was a little bit more fun, and... Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll alternate between the games. Maybe I'll just stick with MXGP3. I don't know. Obviously, a lot of people out there uh, seem to believe that MXGP3 is the better game, so we'll run with it. Um, but yeah, I love, love, love Petra, Mar Petra Murata, the uh, location, the track, etc. Uh, if there's a GP that I want to go to at some point in the future, it is absolutely this one. Beautiful location uh, just at the southern tip of the Swiss Alps. Um, so a very northern part of Italy, essentially. It's... I mean, the track is its a pretty good track in itself because it definitely utilizes the hills and uh, it's a very technical yet tight track, but just the location is a place that I would want to go personally at some point. So um, always love when this GP hits the calendar and man, oh man, it did not disappoint this year for us as uh, we maybe had one of the best MXGP races in uh, recent memory between Tim Geyser and Antonio Cairoli. So we'll go ahead and jump into the discussion about what exactly happened. How did we get maybe the best GP in a long time between these two? Um, well, essentially, it started off with Moto1, Cairoli, leading. Geyser started in fifth and quickly worked his way into second. And before long, he was challenging Cairoli for the lead. Putting the pressure on Antonio seemed like his pace was maybe just a touch better than Cairoli, but I mean, they were about mono a mono. You can't get much closer, I honestly believe, than the pace that they were both running. Um, and Geyser, wisely, I felt, waited to a certain point in the first moto so he could pounce at the uh, right opportunity, essentially, late in the moto and open up a small but manageable lead on Cairoli and won the first race. So we have Geyser win in the first race, uh, which has already happened this year as we think back to Madly Bazin. Um, or no, I'm sorry, he won the second race there, but he's already won a race, I should say, this year, um, where he uh, basically beat Cairoli kind of straight up in that one. Um, but he's yet to win a GP, and he hasn't won a GP, hadn't won a GP, I should say, since 2017, so it's kind of like this pressure cooker situation. A lot of these Slovenian fans come down and cheer at this round. It's one of the closer rounds to Slovenia. So he has like this huge group of people that hang out in the grandstands uh, just after the finish line, jump on this track. And uh, the second moto, I'm telling you guys, please go look it up. Look up the highlights. MXGP Race 2 of the 2019 MXGP of Trantino. One of the better races I feel like I've ever seen. Um, it, it was just geyser hole shots. Cairoli behind him for nine laps. That was just the status quo. They were basically putting qualifying laps down. It seemed like the entire race. I mean, Gautier Paulin started the race in third and finished the race in third, and he was almost a minute behind them at the end of the race. It was insane. But essentially what happened was you have guys are leading, Cairoli challenging, Cairoli catches him, puts the pressure on, eventually makes a... Uh, like pretty, I wouldn't say it was like desperate, but it looked desperate by how he managed to blow the corner out before the mechanics area to make the pass on Geyser. Uh, gets the pass done, and Geyser kind of like blew the outside of the corner anyway, so it was a, a bit of a gimme for Cairoli. The fans go nuts. We're about the halfway point of the race. So then Geyser settles in behind him, and, and pretty quickly you can tell that, that that first race pace that he had where it was like he was... You know, he kind of had a little bit better lines than Cairoli, and it was just like a matter of time until he could figure out a way around him. The second race was kind of the same thing, where it was like his lines were a little bit better, and you kind of saw that as the race developed, where he just slowly figured out and picked apart the spots where he was going to be faster than Cairoli, and then took advantage of the several mistakes that Cairoli was making. Cairoli kept seemingly making um, the same mistake after the finish line, where he kind of like lose his footing and, and um, like get off kilter and <clears throat> Geyser took advantage of him right there where Cairoli like got all stood up weird in the corner and, and, and Geyser went around him and then for another four laps I want to say 
they were just i i don't think you can go much faster around this track than they were going they were pushing the absolute limit of the racetrack the entire way through um it, it was incredible stuff and Cairoli's trying to find a way back through he's pushing geyser the crowd is going nuts because i mean like i said you have a lot of geyser fans there but it's it's the it's a race in italy so you have a huge contingency of antonio Cairoli fans and i mean it's like even watching it uh, uh you know on television for me you could just hear the audience going berserk the entire time it's truly an incredible atmosphere to watch and i would have loved to have been in it but um yeah so Cairoli. Uh, coming to the white flag or no the two lap board maybe um, makes the pass on geyser in the exact same spot he had gotten him for the lead about five or six laps before uh, right before the finish line essentially by the mechanics area he makes uh, like a, a drag race type pass and gets geyser goes three or four more corners again makes a huge mistake after the finish line gets his weight completely thrown off and almost falls off the bike looked like he was damn near like you know had a lot of arm pump and was practically exhausted with the way he was riding but um two corners after that mistake runs a little high on the embankment he sees geysers coming on the inside uh the front end goes right up over the top of the embankment and Cairoli slides down across the track and down he goes uh from the camera angle that we had on television it honestly kind of looked like they had gotten together but if you you know play it back you realize that geysers already kind of by him by that point in time but if Geyser was a few fractions of a second uh, too late, I guess, like further back, they would have definitely collided and both gone down by the way that Cairoli had fallen. So completely his own volition, that mistake out of Cairoli, but it was incredible um, the the fight that he had and, and pushing Geyser to the end and, and the crowd that was going crazy. And So Geyser goes 1-1, sweeps the motos, and uh, Cairoli ends up going 2-2, so he retains the points lead. But again, I seriously if you guys are not watching mxgp i know that we kind of build it out to be sometimes a snoozer where hurlings wins and if hurlings not there Cairoli wins but right now tim geyser has upped his level this season and is coming out fighting i'll tell you that much uh, he's normally pretty good at petra petra Murata, so i wouldn't read heavily into it i still feel Cairoli is for the most part is going to be the uh, better rider at a lot of the tracks they go to but geyser for what it's worth i felt was actually faster at matterly and then he's not really like the best sand rider so it made sense that Cairoli went 1-1 at valkensward but here i mean geyser was he had his number i felt like he was going his pace if not a little bit faster the entire time obviously taking the 1-1 one -one shows that but you know the race itself just seemed like it, it was actually displaying a lot more of a battle than I feel the results she's gonna show. So please, I recommend checking out those highlights online because it, it, it seriously doesn't get much better than than what those guys are doing out there. Um, so now guys are 16 points down the championship. Cairoli, like I said, still maintains the points lead and we're still kind of waiting to hear what exactly is gonna happen with Jeffrey Hurlings. He is yet to be cleared to ride. We're still kind of waiting. That's like within the next week or so, we're gonna hear whether or not he's cleared to ride. He's gonna go back and, and start riding officially. Um, so that news should come shortly. I was actually, the reason I had pushed back the MXGP review so much was I was kind of waiting to hear news on Hurlings. We have such a long time off right now. Like the GP happened on April 7th and obviously uh, as of today, it'll be April tw uh, 19th, I think. So um, it's been a couple you know, weeks essentially since the GP happened. And uh, there's still a couple more weeks before the next GP, which is the MXGP of Lombardia, which is again in Italy, but I think it's the first week, second week in May, first or second week in May. Um, so again, we're still kind of waiting for the early season break to happen uh, as China was supposed to be the GP that kind of slotted in here. I think it was not this weekend, but the next that they were going to go to China um, and then come back to Europe for the continuation of the European swing. But China, uh, the Chinese GP got rescheduled to the end of the season. And I'm hearing through the MX Vice show that there's a potential it gets entirely canceled. So um, we'll have to keep an ear out for that. Um, again, keeping an ear out for hurlings and all that business. But at least for right now, the championship situation between Cairoli and Geyser is a good one. Um, and I say just Cairoli and Geyser because there's really nothing else championship-wise to discuss. Yes, Gautier Paulin went 3-3 for third. He is now third in the championship standings. He's having a great season thus far um, for his uh, Willow Yamaha team. First year on that team for him. Uh, 
but he was just absolutely blown away. Like those guys had sprint speed that it just didn't seem like Paulin uh, had all weekend long, and really it showed on both GPs because he was so far behind at the finish line. Um, so again, like I don't want to say anything negative about Paulin because he's having a great year. Obviously, going three three and landing on the podium is huge, and he accidentally loses a couple more points to those guys instead of huge chunks, but. Uh, He's going to need to kind of step up the game, I feel, to get into their realm, as does anybody, really. I mean, uh, we've kind of lost Clement to Saul. I think he had a uh, knee injury this past weekend, went in and got surgery on it immediately, something with his kneecap, if I remember right. But uh, they think he's going to be back for Lombardia. I'm not sure if that's the case or not. Uh, so with Dassault out, it kind of puts, I feel, Paul in up into the like definitive third best guy on the track grouping, essentially. Um, DeSaul and Paulin always seem to be kind of that third, fourth duo with DeSaul out. Obviously, Paulin's looking kind of the benefactor of that. But uh, like I said, he just needs to find some more pace. And I think that fitness-wise, he's looked good. It's just a pace problem out of uh, out of uh, Gautier Paulin there. Uh, behind Paulin, though, kind of a surprise yet not because he always rides really well here. Arnaud Tonis, his teammate for Wilvo Yamaha, goes 4-4, ends up fourth again. It seemed like kind of a day at the practice track for Wilvo Yamaha. They just were clicking off the times and looking really strong and, and you know, finished 3-4, obviously. Uh, but that's really good to see out of Tonis because he's had a very up-and-down start to his season with crashes and bike malfunctions and other weird things going on. So to put two solid rides in, get some decent points, and, and uh, obviously just miss out on the podium, uh, it's got to be a huge confidence boost for him heading into this break and taking some of that momentum with him into, uh, you know, round five of the series once we come back from the little break that we have here. Uh, but it's good to see Tonus just ride to his potential. He's always had this kind of speed, but he's he's kind of like the faster crash guy. He crashes a lot. He gets hurt a lot, unfortunately. And we've already seen a lot of those big crashes at the beginning of the season. So uh, glad to see he got at least a GP under his belt where everything went a little bit more smoothly. And uh, like I said, rode to his potential. And then behind him, Italians just seem to find their way around these racetracks when we get to him. And Evo Monticelli ends up inside of the top five. So really good rides out of uh, Monticelli to go 5-6 on the day and uh, end up fifth overall. Uh, he had a fantastic start in the first moto. Yeah, first moto because it was... The Italians won 2-3. It was Cairoli got the whole shot. Alessandro Lupino was second. And uh, Monticelli was third. But obviously guys are quickly shuffled through them to get up in the second. And uh, back they went. But still Monticelli hung out right up there at the top of the field. And at least for now, he's uh, kind of the, the best uh, rider for that standing construct KTM team. With Koldenhoff still trying to get back to full health. Max Anstey seemingly not able to put two motos together and uh, Monticelli now putting in a solid ride to end up top five I mean I, I definitely never expected Monticelli to be the more solid guy on that team but thus far it seems like he's going to be the guy because he's slowly been getting better as the season has gone on yes this was a home GP race for him uh, but the next one is also going to be a home GP and even in the preseason testing we saw a lot of uh, you know, racing where Monticelli was right at the sharp end of the field, riding strong. He won the super final at the Hawkstone International. So um, this isn't like flukes out of Monticelli to just end up going 5-6 here at his home GP. I think we're going to see more of this out of him as the series goes on so long as he stays healthy. Um, and, and it's really good to see that he's kind of found his groove, as I said, with Tonus, where two guys that kind of maybe don't always rise to their potential and often ride hurt a lot. Monticelli, another guy that I'm glad to see it working out for him this uh, season thus far and hope it uh, will continue for him. Now behind him, I normally only kind of go through the top five here, but obviously I wanted to talk about Arminus Jasakonis, who continues to be the impressive mark of the season for me, honestly. After a fourth at Valkensuar, just missed the podium. He ends up sixth here in Pietro Morata, Trentino. So, um, you know, this is not a Arminus Jasakonis track. It's very small, very tight. Uh, he's a big guy, a wide open track, pr preferably sand tracks are his forte. So to go sixth here, I feel is almost more impressive than his fourth back at Valkenswaard, if I'm being honest. And uh, he just won uh, the Dutch Masters round that happened the week between where I'm making this video and the GP. So he went 1-1 there, beat a lot of really good dudes, including Gautier Paulin. I mean, 
again, Jassaconis just continuing to kind of impress as the season continues to progress here, essentially. Um, I, I don't have anything negative to say about him because he hasn't done anything bad yet. He hasn't had like a weird bad moto or crashes or he's been healthy, solid, consistent, uh, just everything you want out of a guy like that. And, and he's been great. So I'm looking forward to seeing uh, Jasakonis continue to get better like Monticelli, like Tonus, like see where these guys can go. Where is their potential lie? Can they make it even up onto the podium before the season's over? I think Jasakonis has the potential to um, for sure. And, uh, you know, maybe when we get to another sand race or, or later on in the season, it's uh, going to put that potential forward for him. And maybe we'll see the old Lithuanian man end up on the box. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of a synopsis of the 450 guys. Um, not much else I can say other than, like I said, we lost to Sal, uh, but he should be back. Uh, Jeremy Van Horbeek, I heard, had a... A mechanical problem in the second moto he didn't have a great first moto but a mechanical i believe it was in the second moto that kept him out um and then like i said everybody else is pretty standard it was uh lupino simpson uh coldenhoff and c were rounding out the top 10 from the gps so again like i feel that's pretty stereotypical top 10 tommy searle just missed out julian lieber just missed out um I want to say pretty impressed, I would say, with the, the slow progression of Brian Bogers thus far. I wouldn't say impressed, but it's nice to see it kind of start to happen. Uh, Bogers was able to put in you know, two decently good rides, a bad first moto, but I think Crash has aided that, and then he finished inside of the top 10, I believe, 8th or ninth in the second moto. So, uh, you know, for being Factory Honda's number two man, it's been a pretty lackluster season thus far. Uh, for Bogers and to see him maybe get back to full health and riding capability would be a, a really good sign to see as we continue to move forward. I mean, this break is going to help a lot of guys in terms of their fitness and, and you know getting some health back on their side perhaps. Um, and I think Bogers can use it. And another guy I'm going to talk about in the MX2 class here in a second can also use it. But uh, yeah, just kind of a quick brief synopsis there of the 450 back runners or mid pack runners i should say let's talk about the 250 class the mx2 class mxgp of trentino in italy jorge prado is well on his way i think to taking this points lead back away from thomas Kier Olsen. i'm uh, not actually that impressed with tko not a great weekend out of uh your points leader ends up uh what was he ended up fifth Overall, so you know, I, I felt early on in the season it looked pretty obvious to me. Olsen was the second best guy after this weekend. I'm not so sure. Looks like Prado is clearly the best guy, and then it looks like Olsen is one of many that could finish second. And as it turned out this weekend, Iago Geertz goes one step higher than he did in Valkensward and goes 2 2 for second overall. And that's, I feel pretty impressive because we saw Geertz end up second at Lommel back in 18, I believe it was. And we haven't yet seen him really, I feel like, shine through on a hard pack track. This wasn't necessarily hard pack, it had rained in Trentino uh, leading up to the event and it was actually kind of surprisingly drier than expected, but the, the moisture had still sunk in, sunk in and the ruts were deep and the dirt was maybe a little bit looser than they normally see out of this racetrack so I can't claim it was a fully hard packed surface but Geert still rode pretty impressively I should say uh, for a guy that is kind of known as being really good in the sand and maybe not so much in the hard pack stuff in comparison to his rivals on the racetrack so that was really cool to see Geertz have just two really solid motos he actually passed Tom Vial very late in the first moto kind of made it work for him and then the second moto was just really all alone in second because everything else is going on behind him and Prado was pulling away ahead of him and um, yeah it's good to see for Geertz Belgium's next big hope I feel we've got like kind of the outgoing uh, era of Strybos, Des DeSalle, Van Horbeek, Ken De Dijker um, I guess Julian Lieber's kind of part of that mix but Lieber's I think going to be around for years to come those you know, Belgian superstars that won them the motocross the nations back in 13 are kind of on their way out. And I feel like Belgium's kind of hoping that Geertz becomes the next big superstar out of Belgium. And it's looking pretty good, at least this year. I feel like 
the the last couple of weeks at least, Geertz is is kind of started riding like we know he can ride, and he he can t continue to ride like that, and you know maybe even push his pace up another level to start challenging Prado perhaps on sand tracks. I think that's going to do his confidence wonders as he still has a few more years in this class and it's likely Prado wins the world title this year and is going to be out next year. So it's going to be a slur of guys that can win the world championship next year if there's no Prado. And at the moment, it looks like Yago Geertz is trying to make a case for him right now to be the guy, if you will, um, if that does so happen. So um, like I said, good stuff out of Geertz. I, th <clears throat> I thought he rode well all weekend. Tom Vial, Prado's teammate, the young superstar Frenchman. Um, I spoke kind of how I was a little less than impressed with his sand capabilities at Valkensward and wasn't really a good weekend all around. Well, he immediately shoved all those doubts right behind him and comes out and gets third overall this weekend, or, or a couple weekends ago, I should say, at Trentino. Should have probably got second. I think he you know, folded a little bit under the pressure from Geertz, who's obviously a little bit more experienced in that situation than Vial. Um, but I think in time, those situations will flip in his favor. And like I said, he looked quite fast most of the weekend. The second moto wasn't as great as the first one per se, but to still end up going, you know, six. So he goes three, six for third. Uh, a lot of, like I said, mixing around of the scores as it were in that second moto with guys shuffling around in the mix and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, Vial still ends up on the podium. Two G or two GP podiums in his first career four GPs. Um, that's, that's pretty big stuff. Um, again, talking about Geertz and the potential in terms of world championship caliber riding skill set moving forward, I I'm pretty confident in saying Vial is going to be right in that mix within the next couple of years as he's still quite young and he's obviously been tipped as the Red Bull KTM uh, takeover man once Prado goes out and up into MXGP or to the USA if he does come over here. Um, Vial looks like he's in a pretty good spot to at least follow in Prado's footsteps. Ben Watson, another fourth place. I think he went 4-4 four, four at Matterly uh, for fourth and it goes, uh, what did he go here? He went 7-3 at uh, Trentino to end up fourth overall. So just missed out on the podium again. But uh, I was really glad to see that his second moto was kind of the, the Ben Watson we've been waiting to see. The Ben Watson that we obviously saw at the Motocross Donations is fully capable of winning GPs at the very least, if not challenging Prado on a week-to-week -week basis. Uh, but that is not what we have seen out of him at all this year. And bad starts have definitely hurt his case, I feel. However, his charges through the fields haven't really been up to snuff as I would think he would assume they should be either. So um, good to see that his riding capability kind of came around. He rode really strong, like I said, in the second motor particularly. Uh, caught a lot of guys late and made some good passes. And um, yeah, ends up fourth. And then fifth was TKO, as I had mentioned. So TKO was kind of getting passed in like in situations I don't think he should have been getting passed like he got decent starts both motos and either stayed right where he was or kind of even worked his way backwards and again that's you know I'm not trying to knock his abilities like still finishing fifth in a GP is great but when you have the red plate and you've proven that you've been at least the best guy behind Prado week in and week out to have a weekend like he did here in Trentino is a little alarming because it seems as though he's going to lose the points lead to Prado a much, uh, at a much quicker rate than was initially anticipated after he had whatever it was, like 40-some-odd points on Prado uh, after Prado missed the second GP of the season at Matterly and, and TKO went 1-1 there. So kind of a peculiar weekend. I'll be looking to see whether or not during the break he works on a couple things maybe gets his sprint speed back to where he wants it because that seemed to be lacking early in the race and then uh, his fitness was okay because he was still charging towards the end but he just looked to be like kind of you know motoring just the whole way like not really charging at any point it was just the same laps kind of over and over again I didn't look at the lap chart to see if that that echoes that sentiment per se but that's at least what I saw out of his riding ability uh, during the you know latter part of the GP where yeah, he was still making passes, but it was passes, but it wasn't like he was blowing by people and, and charging all the way up to Geertz or Vial or you know anybody else uh, late in the motor or anything like that. Um, 
So that was the top five. Give a shout to Henry Jacoby, who finished sixth overall at Trentino. He had a pretty big crash in this corner that I'm going through right here, but uh, didn't get hurt and still remounted fine. And then actually won the MX2 class at the Dutch Masters at this past weekend. So um, Jacoby continues to kind of be the impressive story of the season, I would say, uh, from a guy that really I don't feel was expected to be in the hunt for consistent podiums. Um, despite a crash at Trentino, he still looked really good. Still had a, a lot of good charging speed and obviously now goes 1-1 to the Dutch Masters. A lot of these guys that I'm talking about too are going to be racing some uh, some of these races in between the break here. There's another, I believe there's another uh, British motocross race coming up and there was also a French Elite Championship race or something that happened, but uh, Maxime Dupre and uh, Pierre Goupillon won the uh, classes in those races, so it wasn't like anybody really surprising or, or anybody that I'm really talking about in the mix here won those classes. But I'm sure that we're going to see some more of these guys during the break still getting gate drops, still uh, you know trying. Actually, I think, yeah, the Dutch Masters actually what happened Vial went like straight on at the start in Moto2 who did he take out like it's a couple people mixed up that, that all went down in the first corner that um, probably helped Jacoby's case win in the race I think it was the Dutch Masters I could be wrong but uh, yeah I saw a video of it and it looked pretty hectic glad nobody got hurt because it looked like it could have been pretty bad um, but uh, yeah Jacoby shining through want to squeeze the Americans into this video if I can real quick before the end we'll always like trying to keep these things around 30 minutes so I'm sorry I might go a tad over today um, but kind of the big news for American fans I, I would think is Mitchell Harrison coming over to race for Bud Racing Kawasaki for the remainder of the season after uh, Lorenzo Lucercio was supposed to have that ride um, but immigration issues basically cost him that spot he couldn't leave uh, the USA from what I understand or, or like couldn't get to certain countries within Europe that uh, you know his cards weren't allowing him to cross the borders into and stuff like that so essentially they had to give the ride to somebody else and next on their list was Mitchell Harrison who they pulled off of that Rockwell Yamaha team here from the, the United States and moved him over there he had a uh, kind of impressive start to his GP career if you will getting fifth in the qualifying race in the MX2 class on Saturday it didn't really equate to anything great on Sunday um, I think some crashes some early race mishaps didn't help his case but he ended up 19th overall and then uh, looking at the French elite results which he also raced and and like I said Pierre Goupillon won the MX2 class at that race um, Harrison ended up six I think it was um, and I believe he got third in a moto so I think he's just trying to get his feet wet. It's a culture shock when you go to Europe if you're an American and you've grown up just kind of hopping between the states and not traveling as much. Uh, I know Harrison has been to Europe before. I think he raced the Junior World Championship once, but uh, it, like I said, it's a culture shock. I think he's going to slowly learn it, and I think that speed that we saw out of him in the qualifying race is going to come back to shine and be there at some point uh, later down in the season, and obviously he has some time to develop as it's still 15 GPs to go. Uh, and uh, he's still pretty brand new to that race team. The other American, obviously, to speak about is Darian Sanai, who is ever so slowly getting better, and it's so painful to watch. He got a fantastic start in the first moto, was in second right behind Prado, very clearly has the pace to run up front, but after getting uh, the Epstein-Barr virus in December, he is just not able to last the full race distance. It's painfully obvious, everybody can see it. And uh, the second race, he actually went down on the start, uh, got like ran over a bunch, walked off the track and then was like, eh, might as well go back out. Got back on and, and finished the race, I believe, but uh, was several laps down, just kind of out there cruising. And this break couldn't come at a better time for Sinai. Instead of having to fly to China and you know deal with his virus over there with eating you know some food that maybe he wouldn't want to eat, uh, if he was back home and trying to attend to the virus uh, he gets to sit at home basically and, and just try to let Epstein Barr take its course essentially um, it's a it's a you know virus that basically 
it's going to be with him, and he's going to have to deal with it, and slowly it's going to get better. A lot of guys have had Epstein-Barr before, though. Chad Reed is probably one of the more notable guys that had Epstein-Barr in his 2010 title defense when he was on Monster Energy Kawasaki Outdoors. Um, got Epstein-Barr, so it, it's just, it takes time, and having this four-week break is huge for Sinai to get some health back, maybe come out swinging at Lombardia uh, to you know, put the challenge to these guys because, again, he, he led two laps of the qualifying race at Madeley Basin, started up front in the first moto here. Clearly, he has the pace. He's right there with all those guys, and, and it's just like three, four laps in, he hits a cliff and starts going backwards, and it's it sucks to see because this is his last year uh, age-wise in the 250 class, and he's going to be out next year, and, and he really, I feel, if he came in healthy, may have had a chance albeit small, a chance at a world title with the pace that he has been running uh, up until that point. So it's really sucks to see. Hopefully it, it gets better soon. And as an American myself, obviously, I'd like to root him on as he uh, gets over this virus and figures it all out. But that's a wrap-up of the MXGP of Trentino in Italy at Pietra Murata. Freaking amazing track, beautiful facility and a epic MXGP race. Again, I urge you guys to go watch it. I hope you guys enjoyed my synopsis of the GP scene and, and where we're at uh, four rounds into the championship. Uh, Prado, 20 points down of Thomas Kerr Olsen despite missing one GP in the first four, so that's kind of crazy. And then Geyser, 16 points down of Cairoli. That's kind of where we stand championship-wise moving forward. And I thank you guys again so much for watching another video here on Star Your Systems. As always, my name is Kellen. And I'd be glad to continue discussing with you guys in the comment section below. But for now, I'll see you guys in the next one. So long for now.